Last one there is a rotten egg. I know you are, but what am I? My dad can beat up your dad. Whoever smelt it, dealt it. There are certain phrases that stick out that are memorable from our childhood. Maybe none as notable as sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. However, all of us know the reality of that statement actually is sticks and stones may break my bones, but words penetrate my heart. Words devastate. Words linger. Words haunt. Or words strengthen. Words invigorate. Words encourage. Good morning, Spring Lake family. It is so good to be together this morning. If we have not yet met, if you are visiting, my name is Adam. I am the campus pastor here in Bellevue, and we are in week two uh, of a series where we are looking at relationships, four key dynamics in our relationships, not just relationships that are romantic or marital, but the fact that all of us interact with other people, we are in relationships. And last week, Pastor Jack started us out with the law of love. This morning, we are going to be looking at communication, and then in the weeks to come, we are looking at conflict and forgiveness. But this morning, as we look at this component of relationships, we're going to be looking at it as a matter of life or death as it comes to our communication with one another. And three key statements that we're gonna be looking at based on communication. The first one being that your words are a tool that builds or a weapon that destroys. So in the right hands of the right person, a hammer is a great tool can be very effective. However, in the hands of the wrong person, a hammer can be used to bludgeon someone. It's the difference between a handyman or a murderer. The same thing being used, however, is it gonna be used as something constructive or is it gonna be used as something destructive? And the author of Proverbs has something similar to say to, about that as it comes to our words. In Proverbs 18, verse 21, it says, the tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Now just some quick facts about the tongue is that your tongue is actually made up of eight different muscles. Eight different muscles. You're not gonna work those out at CrossFit, but eight different muscles, four of them that control the shape of your tongue, four of them that control the position of your tongue. And it was once believed that the tongue was the strongest muscle in your body. That has since been disproven. But what it may lack there, it makes up for with the powerful impact that your words have. Now think about this because our words so simply can roll off our tongue. There can be things that we say that are spoken thoughtlessly or with the intent of either to help that person, to encourage that person, or to hurt them, to tear them down. And to talk about it as being a matter of life or death might seem like an exaggeration. It might seem like, well, that seems a bit dramatic, but Proverbs is making a vital point that we have to be really careful into not thinking that our words are insignificant, that they're just words. Because words matter. Words can be used to complain or to celebrate. They can be used to criticize or to encourage, to tear down or to build up. They can be used for evil or for good. Words have power. After all, the very first words that we see in the Bible are spoken by God when he created Everything that exists, all of creation being created with his words. We see in Genesis where it says, and God said, and there was. Based on everything that he had called into being, everything was created by the power of his words. And everything that he spoke, everything that he created was good. And from the very beginning, God showed how the power of words can be used. Words give direction. 
Throughout the Bible, God's people are told to hold on to his word, to not turn from his word. In other words, God's words are authoritative, meaning that they are the standard and that we are accountable to the words that he has spoken, that God's words are not simply a suggestion, they're not simply opinion, that God's words are authoritative. And Adam and Eve were told by God not to eat of a, uh, of a certain tree because if they did it, if they disobeyed his word, they would die. There would be consequences. So from the very beginning, we see that God's words are meant to bring about good and, and well-being. They are good for life, and ignoring his words are detrimental. In fact, about Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 33, it says that his words are full of the spirit and life. When Jesus was going around in his earthly ministry and he started saying some harder sayings that started losing the crowds a little bit because people were like, man, I I can't handle this. This is getting a little bit out there and the crowds started leaving. And Peter makes mention of this to Jesus, like Jesus, you're, you're, you're losing your fans, you're losing the crowd and Jesus says, are you gonna go too? Peter says, Where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. So all of God's words are good and meant for good. They are creative, they are authoritative, they are uh, life-giving and spoken for the good of the listener. There is benefit to hearing and acting upon them where they guide and correct, where they're always true, always good. Contrast that to the very first words that were spoken that go against God's ways, those words that were used to cast doubt, those words that were used to deceive, those words that were used to harm, those words that brought about brokenness in all of its ways and the despair that we currently face. And we see that in Genesis 3 as Adam and Eve were tempted to do the very thing God told them not to do. Now, if Satan had grabbed Adam and Eve and tried to drag them over to the tree that God told them not to eat from and said, eat this, eat this, eat this. It might have been very apparent for them. No, we're not going to do it. We're not gonna do that. You can't force us to do that, but notice that he used words, lies that sounded so good, but were drizzled with honey and made it sound so beneficial, but in reality brought death. The Bible calls Satan the father of lies, and his intent is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. His words are used to trick and to deceive. Where God's words bring life, Satan's words bring death. Where God's word always benefits, Satan's word always brings harm. And so here in the Bible, we see a battle of words. How are words gonna be used? Two distinct ways that they can be used, either as building blocks and beneficial to relationships that are God-honoring, or they become the means of tearing down another person, of harming them, of destroying a relationship. Words are incredibly powerful. How many times have you been in a conversation with someone and as you're talking, you bring them to tears and there's kind of two aspects of that. Sometimes you might be talking with someone and you are just encouraging them and the truth that you are sharing with them is so powerful and so good and such a reminder of God's grace that they are overwhelmed with the goodness and it brings joy to their heart and their tears just well up in their eyes. And the words were still good. But then there's other times where tears well up in eyes because words have been said to control, to harm, to hit low, to hit harder, to have the last word feeling like you won because yours was the last voice in the air. If I were to ask you the most painful thing that you've ever had someone tell you, I'm sure many of you could remember. 
I should have never married you. You are a mistake. I wish you were never born. Why can't you be more like so-and-so? Maybe it's something that you tried to do that you put all your heart and effort into it and it was ridiculed. Maybe you tried to look your best and you went out as your best and people just mocked you. Words are incredibly powerful and always and never are two incredibly powerful words that when used well, those things are beneficial and life-giving. Like when you sign your Valentine's card or a nice card, love always and forever. I love you always forever. <laughs> you know, then it is so powerful. That is good. Where it's like, man, I will love you always. My heart is for you always. I am always in your corner. However, on the flip side of that, that can be an incredible weapon. You are always thinking about yourself. You never do the right thing. You never do anything right. And then those words become incredible weapons that are used against the other person. Here Proverbs is saying that the one who is careful with their words and using them in a God-glorifying way will experience the benefits of that. This verse says that those who use their words in the right way will experience, will enjoy its fruit. In other words, there is a sweetness that comes in using our words productively, thoughtfully, humbly, to consider the other person better than ourself. However, Proverbs 13, verse three, reveals the impact of not being controlled in what, we see, in what we say. And we see that there where it says, those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. So are we gonna use our words to build or to destroy? Are we gonna seek the good of others or are we gonna seek the good of ourselves at the expense of others? Second statement about words, your words flow from your heart. Now when we think about our words and the things that we say, sometimes we try to excuse the things we say because we kinda go to the default, well you don't know what I'm dealing with. You don't know who I'm living with. You don't know what I have to put up with. But our ability to build or to destroy with our words is not dependent on the other person. Our calling to speak words of life, of truth, and grace is not dependent on the other person because speaking words of grace is by default for the undeserving. Because grace is never deserved. It's always getting what we don't deserve, so that's why it's called grace. The other person is not the one who chooses the words that we say or how we say them. Sure, many of us have heard this phrase, if we haven't used it ourselves, if you would not have made me so mad, I would not have said what I said. In other words, if you hadn't added your ugly, to the mix, I wouldn't have had to add my own ugly to the mix. And so I get a hall pass because you started it. You did this, so I did this, and that makes my part okay. But that's not what we see from the Bible. That the other person does not hold the power over us as far as what we choose to say. No one holds that much power over us. The Bible tells us that the words don't come from anywhere but our own heart. Check out Matthew ch chapter 12, verse 33. It says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you, 
that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and your, by your words you will be condemned. In other words, he's saying those eight muscles that control your tongue are actually fueled by your heart. That your mouth is actually the exhaust pipe of your heart. That what you have stored in here is actually what's coming out of here. And so it's not from other people that cause the things that come out of your mouth. It's from what you hold dear to yourself. It reveals, our words reveal our values and perspectives. Jesus says that a tree is recognized by its fruit. So you can't convince someone that an orange tree is an apple tree. Not once the fruit is apparent. An apple tree is not an apple tree because of an orange tree. An apple tree is an apple tree because it's an apple tree. Now, if that's confusing, the point being is that you do not speak the way you speak because of anyone else but yourself. The way you speak, what comes out of your mouth, is because that is what is inside of you. Oftentimes we think, well, I'm a good person. It's this evil person that's bringing the evil out in me. But in reality, it's exposing what is already there. And many times people don't like the ugly that they see that comes out of them, which is why we want the hall pass. And we want to blame. I said what I said. I only did this. I only went to this degree. I only napalmed the conversation because of what you did, of what you said, but here we see there's no excuse, there's no hall pass. Each one of us are accountable for the words that we choose to say. Look at what he says in verse 36. I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Some translations translate that empty word as careless word. In other words, every flippant word, every knee-jerk word, reaction word that spews out of our mouth. If someone says something painful or wrong, it doesn't help to contribute our own mess to it. Like none of us having kids would go into their room and say, you know, it was okay if one of them made a mess and to clean it up, they just added more mess. Like adding a mess on top of a mess never helps anything get better and yet so many times when it comes to our relationships, that's how we deal with the ugly. We add our own ugly to the mix. And the answer to a destructive tongue, a tongue that desires to destroy, to harm, to hurt other people is not soap because soap isn't going to cleanse the heart. The only way that you can have your mouth cleaned up is to have a new heart that is given by Jesus to be transformed from the inside out where Jesus transforms our life. That if our tongues are fueled by the heart, then we need a brand new heart that is gonna beat for the glory of God and give him honor with the way that we live our lives. That it's gonna be genuine in its goodness and its grace. And having this kind of fruit is not self-made. It's the result of being transformed and being surrendered to Jesus. And then there's gonna be real fruit that comes out of our lives, real fruit that benefits our relationships, real fruit that encourages the people that we are with, that is gonna be evident. And what does that look like? We see that in Galatians chapter five, beginning in verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit, and so when we are surrendered to the Holy Spirit's leading in our life, the way in which we speak, the Holy Spirit is gonna be evident because it's gonna be words that reflect these things. That there's gonna be love. There's gonna be self-control. There's gonna be goodness. 
that we're not simply going to react to a situation. We're going to be led in the situation, and there's going to be growing evidence of transformation in our lives. And some of us have experienced that. Or maybe the way in which you always dealt with conflict in the past or your anger or someone said something that you didn't like or said something that you didn't agree with, that you always reacted in a certain way. The four-letter words were your favorite. And now there has been a transforming power in your life where your speech is different. Because your sin, the way that you used to do things, the old you, Upon putting your trust in Jesus, the old you and your sin has been nailed to the cross. And it's so important for us as followers of Jesus to realize the power of our sin being nailed to the cross, not put to the cross with a sticky note, not put to the cross with a push pin where it can easily fall off and easily be picked back up that we can just take that on again if we so choose to do so, but our sin has been nailed to the cross, crucified with Jesus, so we don't have the right just to take that back and live that way once again whenever we feel like it. We are in the process of being transformed for the glory of God. Jesus died to set us free from our sin, not so that we can continually make excuse for our sin. So keeping in step with the Spirit means that there are gonna be times in our communication where we just have to hold our tongue. We don't always have to have something to say. Sometimes being led by the Spirit, we're saying, give me the words, give me the words. There are no words. I'm gonna shut up. I'm not gonna say anything. Because sometimes to add something unnecessarily is just going to make it messier. So when we walk with the Spirit, our hearts are transformed and our words are used as instruments of good and that boils down to our last point to consider in our relationships, your words matter to God. On one hand, we could say, okay, so our words can be used for good or for bad, get that. You kind of see it as an option, which one am I gonna do? You can say, okay, so our words reveal what's in our heart. Okay, I realize, you know, it's not always the greatest, but this last point is huge. Your words matter to God. We see that in James chapter three. He says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with it we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So when we walk by the Spirit, we don't resort to knee-jerk reactions, nor do we elevate realness over holiness. Every aspect of our lives should be brought under the control of the Holy Spirit's leading in our life. There's not a single aspect of our lives that God does not care about. In fact, we see in Galatians 3, verse 17, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There can be a tendency today to see keeping it real as a greater virtue than keeping it holy. Now hear me out, I'm not saying we pretend, I'm not saying we put on a show, none of us are perfect, all of us struggle in a variety of ways. However, I am concerned about a mindset that excuses realness as a means of avoiding repentance. Realness at the cost of holiness. 
Realness that just sees the highest virtue of just revealing whatever is inside of us. People can say whatever they want to say because, hey, they're just keeping it real. They're just being authentic. Where we can say what we want, call people what we want because we're just keeping it real. But what if in the keeping it real, it's actually really exposing something ugly? The danger is thinking, hey, I'm okay because I'm just keeping it real. But we're living or we're saying things that go totally contrary to what God has said. And so the virtue of keeping it real means like, hey, I get this go free card because it comes from my most authentic self, but God wants to take your most authentic self and transform you so that you are authentically following him. So that it's not a matter of, hey, I can do whatever I want to do, but in our authenticity of our failure of realizing I need to apologize for the things that I just said. I was out of line. I'm sorry. I said that in the heat of the moment. I am sorry. I was only thinking about myself. I am sorry. So it's not a matter of just keeping it real. It's a matter of really desiring to honor God with our words. After all, James says that it only takes a spark not to get a fire going like you might want to sing, but to actually cause a wildfire. And many of us, I mean, we saw those California wildfires where it just takes a firework or something like that and the devastation it causes. Similarly with our words, man, you can say something that in the moment, hey, it was just, you know, it made me feel good, but then all of a sudden those words spread. And the impact of that and the harm of that and the hurt of that, man, it was just a disagreement. It was just an argument. And later in the week, later in the month, those words are still stewing. Years later, those words are still stewing. And some of you are dealing with words that you've heard and you're trying so hard to disprove those things that have been said about you or to you. Because words can be so destructive. He also compares it to a restless evil full of poison like this wild beast that bites, that makes the initial point of contact, and then the poison just spreads and lingers. That is the power of our words, where the power of our words continue to linger long after they have been said. And as Christ followers, we don't have any excuse to say whatever we want to say and however we want to say it. So James brings us out in verse nine, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Many times it's the politicians that get accused for flip-flop. Right? They campaign on one thing. Oh, it sounds so good. Oh, you kiss babies. Oh, this is so great. And then they get in office and all of a sudden their legislation and the things they want to pass. Wait a minute. People say flip-flop, and yet James is calling out each one of us that flip-flop with our mouth, that we sit here on a Sunday morning and, oh, we praise you, God, you are worthy, and then we go into the office the next day, or we're in school, or in the locker room, we're hanging with the guys, someone cuts us off in traffic, and it's something completely different. We have flip-flopped, he's like, that's not how it's supposed to be. And yet we think words don't matter. But what we see, words do matter. Words do matter to God. In Ephesians 4, we close with this, verse 29, he says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind, compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So we want to be real. We want to be genuine. We want to be genuine followers of Jesus who are being transformed from the inside out. People that are driven not by emotion, 
not reacting to circumstance, but people that are led by his Holy Spirit. As Christ followers, desiring to benefit those that are around us, using the words at our disposal as a tool to build up, to encourage, to give joy, to make a positive impact, a God-honoring impact, an impact that benefits our relationships. And so I wanna encourage you today to be thinking through how can you be using your words today? Not just because it's Mother's Day, but to say something beneficial and encouraging in the life of another person. Maybe it's acknowledging the way they provide or nurtured. Maybe it's encouraging them in the growth that you've seen in their life. Maybe it's encouraging them because they're in the midst of the struggle and it's reminding them of God's faithfulness to them, his presence that will never leave them in the hardest of struggles, to use your words in a beneficial way that builds up. We have a whole Home Depot way of ways in which we can build up one another with our words. The question is, are we going to do that? Don't waste your words. It's a matter of life or death. Will you pray with me? Father, we need you. God, I believe that there are some things that we excuse because we compare sins as far as the degrees and what is tolerable and and, and what we can do, and yet, God, all sin is offensive before you. And God, we confess the ways in which we have used our words to only benefit ourselves at the expense of others. We confess the times that we have used our words to harm and so, God, we, we ask that you would tra- transform us from the inside out, that we would use our words in a way that points to you, in a way that treats people the way that you have treated us, with grace and truth. So, God, thank you that we can count on your words. Thank you that your words never fail and that they are for our good. Help us to listen to them. In Jesus' name we pray.